Ah, who's the host? I was just going to share the screen. <laughs> Well, he should make me the host. And that's how it would work. You can't make You can't make me a seat. God is good all the time. Good morning. Good morning. Well, God is good. Can you make me the host? So I can share this screen and they can see the PowerPoint too. Is there anybody joining us on the Zoom? Of the story of Esther. Uh, today, I'm going to try to rapidly move forward. I was a lot of three Sundays to be able to present this lesson to you. But I do remember when I taught this uh, study at a Bible group in the Campbell's home, we took about seven or eight Sundays and an hour and a half per clip. Do this in three 45 minute sessions. So I've been going kind of quickly. I was more long-winded then, given a lot more to be there. But I hope to be able to reach that mile marker today and finish up. And if I don't, Doug has graciously agreed to give me a little bit of time next Sunday, just in case we need to finish it up. When we were last week, we uh, talked about the personalities. I call this the cast. And you have a playbill in your hand. I think David gave those out. I need an extra one, but all these folks play key roles in the story of Esther. We talked about their personalities. Before I tell you, before we go back and review these real quickly, I have a brief story to tell you about a pastor and their son. A pastor was delivering a sermon, and midway through the sermon, his seven-year-old son was sitting on the back row of the pews. Midway through, the little boy stands up. And he takes a pea shooter and he starts shooting people in the back of the head, Greg. Right. Well, needless to say, the pastor was very furious. <clears throat> so before he was going to publicly scold his son in front of the congregation and everybody, the little boy yells out, Dad, you teach, you keep preaching at them, and I'll keep shooting at them and keeping them awake. <laughs> now, to give you a fair warning, I have given Steve Ginn a pea shooter this morning, Joe Snap, in case anybody should nod off because Steve is locked and loaded with his pea shooter. You wake me up. <laughs> <laughs> Our uh, administrative assistant, Rebecca, uh, sent out the newsletter this week all about all the details for our trip to Esther. We have a block of 55 tickets that we're making available to our congregation. We have 11 people who have reserved tickets, so there's still plenty of tickets remaining for anyone who would like to go. Please look at your newsletter for all the details. It lines it out very, very well for you there. Now, one thing that I always like to do, I like to go back and just review a little bit of what we covered last time. So I'm going to play this quick game, Who Am I? Just a second and I'll find it. It involves the personalities of our cast. I'm a strong, I have a strong knowledge of Persian law. I would often advise the king when he needed guidance. Who am I? My Nukin. My Nukin. Remember, he was the lawyer and he was an advisor to the king. All right, here's another. Who am I? I lust for power, wealth, and control. I expect others to bow down to me. Who am I? Haman or Hannah. Yeah, remember, he was that egotistical person that felt he was far better than everyone else. I'm sure you might know some people like that. My name means beautiful. I value my integrity. I will stand firm and say no, no matter what the cost. Who am I? Queen Vashti. Absolutely. She highly respected herself. And remember, who did she say no to? King Xerxes when he invited her to this party. These qualities are often spoken of me. I am always kind to others. My speech is always gracious. 
and I do unto others as I would have them do unto me. Who am I? Who? Yeah. 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 No. My words are always gracious. I'm always kind to others. I will do unto others as they would do unto me. Who? Esther. 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 One more. Um, my name means follower. I quickly show compassion to others who win the favor of God. I play the role of a step parent. Who am I? Mordecai. Of Mordecai. Of all these individuals, Steve Campbell, who would you like to invite to dinner? Who would you like to spend time with? What about Bertie Lance? <laughs> <laughs> would you want to spend time with Zuresh, who is the wife? Would you want to spend time with Oh, Would you want to spend time with one of these two characters, which was Big Tan or Teresh, the Royal Guards? Who would you want to spend time with, Steve? Queen Bosch. Queen Bosch. <laughs> she seemed like a decent person. But some of these, she, some she of these individuals I was talking She's single. Oh, my. <laughs> in your playbill, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, we approach this study as if we were completing a playbill because of the fact that Esther is being produced live on stage at Sights and Sounds as we speak. And the playbill, as you know, kind of reveals the events that take place in the play. Now, there are two acts that I've broken the, the study of Esther. Act one, which are the hard times, chapter one through seven, and then hopefully we'll get through these today and look at act two, which is the good times, chapter eight through 10. Why did the queen refuse to go to the king's banquet? Yes, Laura. Why because did the queen drunken party. Refuse? Hmm? Because it was a drunken party, but at the same time, she just decided that it was not worth the time. Right. It was a drunken party, and the king just wanted to show off his lovely wife and so that all of his friends can see how fortunate he was. What was the king's decree? Who remembers the decree that the king wrote regarding the queen's refusal? She no longer was queen. No, she's no, no longer a queen. She's been banished, and then all women are to either. Husbands are Yes. The wives are be are be are to be submissive to their husbands because the man is the king of the house. Like the, the good old days. <laughs> the good old days. So therefore, with Queen Vashti now out of the picture, it left King Xerxes uh, in a dilemma. He was lonely. He had no queen. So what did he do? He searched for a new queen. And how did they search for a new queen? <laughs> How do they search for a new queen? So he says that every province in the Persian Empire, and how many were there? 127. Every province was to make available a young woman or a young girl that would compete for the royal queen. So today we are going to go ahead and continue looking at the very one that I have for you is the queen. So in your playbook, you can go ahead and include that. And then I want to give you a brief description as we move forward. Young Odessa was the chosen one from her province. She, she was brought to the king's palace along with the other 126 young girls. Haggai, who remembers Haggai? What did he do? Hey guys, right here. What was his responsibility? He was a beauty advisor. <laughs> so therefore, he took a special liking to Odessa. He was impressed with her charm, her grace, and he ordered a special menu. He gave her a luxurious apartment. He assigned her seven maids to care for her. She was special in his eyes. And she was given six months of perfume and ointment treatment. Kelly, would you like to have that? Six months of beauty treatments or sending six months of work, special appointments? No. <laughs> no. 
remember, it took one year for Haggai to transform a young girl into a mature woman. And what was he doing that for? In preparation for the king. Now keep in mind that Hadessa was a Jewish girl because Hadessa is a Jewish name. So therefore, Mordecai encouraged Hadessa to change her name. Why did she, why did Mordecai encourage that? Jews were looked down upon. And no one knows she's a Jew. Right. Hadessa did not want to reveal herself as being a Jew because she would be looked down upon. So therefore, this leads us now to Esther is crowned as the king. This is your next scene that takes place after the grooming was completed. Okay. Flip that to the next one. I'm giving you some pictures that will give you kind of a visual of what maybe what's taking place. Each girl from each province was prepared to spend one evening with the king. Upon Esther's visit, the king fell in love with Esther only because of the fact of her beauty and her grace. He was so delighted that he automatically crowned Esther as being the queen. And to celebrate, King Xerxes wanted to have a party. Because he always <laughs> How long was this party? How many days? 180 days. Six months. He parties. Wow. Yeah. Now, the next scene, as I said, <laughs> I am going to move quickly. <laughs> Doug's got the clock on me today. <laughs> we have, if you see that or not, four guys denial. The grooming has been completed, the queen has been selected. And now we've switched to a different scene in the uh, play, which is Mordecai's denial. The king appointed Haman, that dreadful, egotistical man, to be his prime minister. He was one of the more successful governors of the 127 provinces. Now remember, that made him the second most powerful man in the empire. Mm -hmm. Haman, because of his egotistical attitude, felt that he should be bowed down to because he thought he was a deity. So therefore, one day, Haman was passing Mordecai in the palace court. Haman expected Mordecai to bow down to him, but Mordecai refused. Why do you think Mordecai refused to bow down to Haman? He was only going to bow down to his one only true God. Absolutely. Mordecai knew, this, knew who his God was, and it wasn't Haman. Haman wasn't his deity. So therefore, that makes Haman extremely furious. So he decided to move against Haman because he was an Agagite. I'm going to give you a quick history lesson. I've shared this with you before. Haman is a descendant of King Agag. King Agag and the Amalekites attacked the Jews when they left Egypt when they were released from captivity. They killed women, they killed children, they killed men. And they took all their personal possessions. All by the Amalekites. Haman is the descendant of Malachi. Still carried that attitude for the Jews. It was in his mind that he was far greater than a Jew. So therefore, he was going to put an end to all Jews in the Persian Empire. Interesting, isn't it? I'm telling you, he was a vicious man. <clears throat> so Haman approached the king, and he asked the king, or he said to the king, there's a specific race that's residing in your empire. They're bad. They're a bad influence upon our country. Their laws are different. They refuse to obey your laws, and one day they're going to rebel against you. That's what Haman planted in the mind of King Xerxes. How do you think King Xerxes responded? Remember, he's easily influenced by those around him based on which way the wind is blowing that day is how he decides. And it just so happens the wind was blowing in favor of Haman. So what does he do? Haman convinces the king to write a decree. Haman's decree. You see that? Let's take a look at Haman's decree. If it pleases the king, issue a decree that they will be destroyed, the Jews, 
and I will pay your royal treasury $20 million from my own personal account, and we'll put in the royal treasury that will take care of the expense of purging the Jews. This guy was pretty vicious. He was pretty dangerous. Well, instantly, the king agreed. Remember, once a decree is written by Persian law, it cannot be reversed. Even the king wrote it. He could not go back and erase it. It's locked in the books. It's etched in. So I put the Jews in jeopardy. So therefore, the king's secretary got busy dictating letters to all the provinces and sent that whole decree as law throughout the entire Persian Empire. You heard Pastor Larry talk a little bit this morning about rolling the dice. He rolled the dice in April of that year when this decree was written. I'm not quite sure how the dice ended up reflecting February the 28th. Doug, do you know? They were drawing lots or something. My understanding is one dice had numbers and one had months. That's, months. that's my understanding. Numbers and months. So when Haman rolled the dice, it came up February the 28th is when all Jews will be annihilated from the Russian or from the uh, Persian Empire. That's what we're having to do, deal with. That meant all women, all children, men and all their personal possessions would be plundered. And those assassins would take possession of their property. This is pretty, pretty gruesome stuff. Now, let's go to the next one. This time, this is the morning. This is the next scene that takes place. Let me share that with you. When Mordecai, who was the cousin or uncle of Esther, when he heard of the news, he ripped off his clothes, and in place he put on sackcloth, and he covered himself with ashes. Does anybody know what sackcloth is made of? It's an burlap. 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 It's, a, it's similar to burlap, just as rough as burlap. It's made from goat's hair, mm -hmm. and he also covered himself with ashes, and then he publicly went out in the courtyard, and what do you think he did? It was a uh, traditional Hebrew tradition for Jewish to go out and publicly uh, mourn uh, with grief. It's a symbol of mourning. Very much like when we wear black to a funeral. It's our symbolism of mourning. That was the symbolism of the Jewish mourning. Um, when Esther's, remember I told you earlier that she had seven maidens that was assigned to her by Haggai. When Esther's seven maidens told her about Mordecai, she was extremely distressed about what was going to take place. So now she sent Hytok, which is the last guy on the end. She sent Hytok to go talk to Mordecai and get the full story. Mordecai then gave Hytok copy of the decree that has been written and it was and he was going to plead for Esther to go to the king and save her and save the Jewish population. Now we move to the next scene. As I said I was with the this is probably one of the most significant scenes that took place in the entire story of Esther. I was created for this moment. Remember Esther received his request from Mordecai to go to the king and defend the lives of the Jews, but she feared for her life. Why would the queen fear going to the king after all they were married? You couldn't go to the king unless he called you. Kathleen, you're exactly right. You cannot approach the king unless you've been invited. If she were to approach the king uninvited, what could he then do or have ordered done? Would kill her? Would he kill the queen? What would he do with Queen Vashti? I don't know. I'm not sure. Whatever the way the wind was blowing. I'm not sure. <laughs> However, unless the king extends his gold scepter to welcome her and she can touch it, he would then welcome her. That's the dilemma that she was facing. She was facing a risk. Of her own life being killed by the king. So, wow. Um, Hytak returned to Mordecai this message 
And this is how Mordecai responds to Esther. Kelly, could you read for us the most significant verse in the entire book of Esther? <clears throat> For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your father's family will perish. And who knows, but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Wow, that's a pretty heavy verse. If you keep quiet at a time like this, Mordecai referring to Esther, God will deliver the Jews from some other source but you and your relatives will die. And what's more, what's more, who can say but God has brought you into this palace at just such a time as this. In your playbill, I have that um, particular scripture detailed with some missing words. So you might want to, might want to fill those blanks in Go ahead and drop this back in so you can see if I've got them all on the line. Okay. 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 He has all the line. The four is that you need. And then let me share with you the other pictures. If you remember anything about the book of Esther, this is the one particular scripture that stands out among all the verses in that book. Can I drop it down? Yeah. There may be an extra line in the last two words, so you may have such a possible. So this is the most significant person. I need to see this one. First page. Yep. I think it's worth taking just a few extra minutes and talking in detail about this verse. So, all of the most important things worth mentioning. God uses ordinary people to do extraordinary things. Esther just happened to be in the right place at the right time. I believe. I believe. God has a plan for Esther, and I believe, too, that God has a plan for each one of us. Some of us may know very clearly what our plan is. Others will be searching. Esther wasn't quite sure what her plan was. She was fearful. She was afraid to go to the king with this message that Mordecai encouraged her to say. <laughs> well, she was going to be killed. Killed by the king. Can you blame her? Can you blame her? Did you put your life on the line to save an entire Jewish nation? You don't need to answer, but it's certainly something to think about. <laughs> but Esther had a passion. Number 11, Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you. You were paying attention. Get extra points, Josh. If you turn your test paper in this week, I'll give you five extra points. <laughs> That's one text, Kim, when I had you as a student. Every day. Every day. You share this five <laughs> Joe, <laughs> Kato came out today with uh, a little bit of the story of Esther and, and folded in. Uh, Martin Luther King in a similar kind of fashion. Yeah, yeah. And he was fighting for that particular um, population. Yeah, and he had death threats. He knew that if he continued, sure, he and his family would break the Absolutely. He had actual phone calls. So that's something a little more relevant that Doug just shared. And of course, people during those times experienced it too. And I think we're going to experience it as time goes on more and more. When you I say we, way yeah, it, who are you referring to? As well, we? the way that our world is going. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think we as Christians, Christians, we as Christians are under severe persecution. And I think it will worsen. 
Um, I think as far as for the Jewish nation, Israel will come under a lot more persecution. There are probably, I don't know, somebody quoted 37 nations would like to see Israel destroyed. I don't care for them. But my thought is, after studying King David, Israel is God's chosen land. They're his, God, they're, they're his chosen people. They can choose to mess with them if they want to. But God is going to judge them, and he is going to uh, probably persecute them. So anyway, let, let's get back on topic here. I've broken this, this verse down into two parts. If you remain silent, here's a question for you. You can care to share or just think about it. Have you ever had the opportunity to speak up or stand up for something that's right, but remain silent? Think about that for 30 seconds. Have you ever had the opportunity to stand up or speak up for something that was right, but you chose to remain silent? Barbara, is it okay if I share the story about Jimmy Lee and the little special ed student at James Wood when he got in trouble? Jimmy Lee, our son, was in high school, and Jimmy Lee was the type of guy that protected others. Still does. <laughs> he still does. One day, there were a group of bullies that were bullying the special needs student. Jimmy Lee witnessed it going on. He told him to stop, but this one particular guy in the group, he probably was a bully for about the entire school, causing him and everything. Jimmy goes up to him and said, listen, buddy, you better stop. I'm telling you right now, and the guy just laughed him off. So Jimmy Lee hit Buddy, broke his teeth, I think, and he required a little uh, financial repair that, that mom had to pay for. <laughs> Jimmy Lee saw something going down that was wrong. He knew it wasn't right. So he took it in his own hands to get physical. I'm not saying, Joe, get physical with you. <laughs> I'm saying is that sometimes you need to defend those who cannot defend themselves. And this is an excellent case with Esther. She was created for this moment. Then the Jewish population in the Persian Empire, and she had the position to do it, but she had to take a risk. Jimmy Lee took a risk. He paid the price. Esther's going to now take a risk and may have to pay the price of losing her life if she approaches the king. But We'll read further about what happens here in a moment. Here's the second part of this scripture I want us to give thought to. God will accomplish his purposes with us or without us. Greg is going to move on with you helping him or he's going to move on to somebody else. People in his plan helping him. So I have to make a decision. Am I going to help God carry out his plan or am I just going to brush him off? Esther chose to be obedient. She chose to answer the call and to follow God's will. But in this case, it took others to convince her to do so. Who was that other that convinced her to do so? Who? Mordecai. Mordecai. Mordecai stepped up and says, Esther, you have got to use your position and go to the king and explain to him it cannot happen. My question for all of you. Has God placed someone in your pathway, a friend, a relative, a mentor, a grandparent, a brother, a sister, a mom, a dad, <clears throat> carry out God's plan? <clears throat> has anybody been in your pathway within your lifespan that has helped direct you, that God may have put him there or her there for you to direct you? Anybody? Don't have to answer, but it's something to think about. Because in this particular case, God was working behind the scenes. He was putting people in specific places to direct and lead Esther where she needed to go. Remarkable story, folks. Remarkable story. Now, Esther sent the message back to Mordecai. This time, Catherine, you were agreed to read chapter 4, verse 16. What did Esther say to Mordecai? Go ahead. Go gather together all the Jews that are present in Shushan and pass to you for me, and neither eat nor drink three days, nights or day, night or day, 
I also in my maiden will pass likewise, and so will I not, so will I go unto the king, which is not according to the law. And if I perish, I perish. Wow. If I perish, I perish. She chose to step out and stand up for what was right rather than remain silent. She's going to go to the king and she's going to just basically address the king and explain the situation to him. Hmm. Interesting. Thank you, Catherine. Let's go to um, number 11. Joe, did in your study, did uh, anything come out as to why they declared fast? What was the rationale fasting? The fast. Well, I think that was a tradition. That was to and help me. I'm losing my words here. Maybe a time to really show their obedience to God by fasting, being in deep prayer, because that's what God wants us to do. To maybe show our obedience to Him, and I think that's probably had a great impact on the direction of the story. And, um, you know, we practice fasting and prayer today. And Esther called out to Mordecai to rally the troops, have them all get together throughout and do that for the benefit of Esther. So she could maybe take herself in front of the king without being killed. Let's move on to uh, scene 11. This time it's Esther's banquet. Esther elected to approach the king at risk. He held the gold scepter out, oh my goodness, which was a welcoming sign. It's a symbol of acceptance and he welcomed Esther. So she wasn't killed by approaching him without first being summoned. This is what the king said to Esther. What do you wish? Why are you here? What's your request? And the king said, I will give it to you, even if it's half my kingdom. Wow. The king really loved Esther. He was willing to give Esther half her kingdom. Esther replied, if it pleases your majesty, I want you and Haman to come to a banquet that I've prepared specifically for you today. So the king replied, sure. We'll come, we'll be there. Now tell me what you really want. Esther says, King, you love me. If you come again tomorrow, I'll explain what this is all about. So therefore, we went to a banquet just to sit and eat, probably to soften some of the tensions. Actually, Esther was preparing to really explain what was going to take place. In their very next day. Now we come to Haman's anger. 12. Haman goes to the banquet. He's boasting, look at me. I got invited to a banquet by the queen. I'm the second most powerful man in the kingdom. So therefore, there's that egotistical attitude again. Haman, he leaves the banquet, and this time he sees Mordecai again. What is Haman expecting Mordecai to do? Bow down. down. Does Mordecai bow down? Absolutely. No way, Kathleen. How do you think the reaction from Haman was? He was upset because it was a king's command that everybody bow down to Haman. <laughs> Well, Haman shares this with his wife. <laughs> that once again, Mordecai did not bow down to me. Remember his wife, the Zeresh? And I compared her to the wicked witch of the West and the Wizard of Oz. <laughs> so Haman shares this with his wife. So Zeresh, this is her part, which is very small, her part of the play. She suggested to Haman, go build a 75-foot gallery do it quickly, put Mordecai on it, and hang him tomorrow. Well, this pleased Haman, so he quickly got all of his cronies together, and they built this gallery. It went up in hours, and it was ready to be used the very next day. Now, we're shifted a little bit away from that part of the story. And now we go into the king's quarters. The king is awakened. 
trouble, the, the king was having trouble sleeping that evening. Just could not get to sleep. Something was plotting him. I think it was God. I think it was God touching his heart, touching his mind, and made him feel a little bit angst that evening. My question to you, have you ever been woken, awakened in the night with a problem? Not from your wife kicking you because you're snoring, <laughs> but have you ever woke up and has something serious been on your mind to think about, to work through? It happens to me frequently. When I wake up, God is always on my mind. I'm telling you it happens. God is speaking to me in my sleep and he wakes me. And I'll have a little conversation and I'll go back to sleep. We worked something out that was bothering me. I truly believe that. And in this particular case, God awakens uh, the king. So he orders his readers to go to the historical records, the archives, bring me some historical readings and read them to me while I lie here in bed. What more boring can that be? <laughs> so during the reading, the readers came across where Mordecai exposed a plot by these two guys down here. Remember these are the royal palace guards? They stood outside the king's room and they were to guard the king. They got fed up with this needy foolishness. So therefore they plotted, and I think I told you that while one guarded the door, one would go get the king his wine and put poison in it and bring it back and give it to the king. They wanted to eliminate it. Mordecai heard of that and reported that to the royal palace. The king asked, has anything been awarded to Mordecai to award him for unveiling this plot? And the reader said, no, nothing has happened. And then here comes Haman again. He's always showing up. He comes bouncing in, and the king asked Haman, what should I do to honor a man who truly proves it? Well, here's Haman again. You know, he's, he's pushing his chest out. Well, the king must be talking about me. What can I do to honor you, Haman? No, that wasn't the case. So therefore, once again, Haman is kind of being self-centered. And Haman replies, or chapter 6, 7 through 8. You've got seven through yeah. eight. Okay. Then Haman said to the king, for the man whom the king desires to honor, let them bring a royal robe which the king has worn, and the horse on which the king has ridden, and on, on whose head royal crown has been placed. Wow. Oh, he was to be honored with royal robes, the king's horse. Haman thought he was originally talking about him, but he's actually talking about Mordecai. So therefore, Haman goes running off his toys. He's been, he's been upset because he thought it was all about him, but no, it was about Mordecai. Now we go to scene 14. Mordecai is honored. So Mordecai is dressed in king's clothes, he's on the king's horse, and they head through the streets of the royal palace. And therefore, Haman has to shout. This is the way the king honors those who delights. <laughs> what a contrast now. Haman thought it was him, but instead it's Mordecai. What a, what a contrast. That was a short scene. <laughs> now we go to scene 15. Now we go back to Esther's request. Remember, he she already invited Haman and the king originally to her palace. Remember, she lives in a separate palace from the king. So now that second banquet occurs. Haman and the king arrive at the Esther's banquet. This will be the time now that Hester, uh, Esther will reveal her identity that she's a Jew. Up to this point, the king did not know she was a Jew. Remember the decree earlier? Uh, I think it was Haman's decree that all Jews would be killed on the 28th of February. The king now asked Esther, now what is it that you want? I'll give you anything you want. I'll give you half my kingdom. <clears throat> Just tell me what you want. Chapter 7, Steve, verse 3 and 4. Then Queen Esther answered, If I have found favor with you, your majesty, and if it pleases you, 
grant me my life. This is my petition. And spare my people. This is my request. For I and my people have been sold to be destroyed, killed, and annihilated. If we had merely been sold as male and female slaves, I would have kept quiet because no such distress would justify disturbing the king. The king's response, Esther, what are you talking about? What do you mean your life is at risk? When all of your Jewish people will be put to death. I don't know what you're talking about. And then this was Esther reveals the story. She says, who wants to harm you? And Esther replied, that wicked man right there, Haman. He wants to kill me and my people because I am of the Jewish faith. Exhale. Final scene in Act 1. Now we begin to see Haman's downfall. Celebration. Haman is a wicked man. I'm going to give you another history lesson real quick. Who was the first king of Israel? Ends with an S, ends with L. Saul. 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 Saul was the first anointed king to Israel. Saul was a great king for the first few years, but he had a downfall because he disobeyed God. God requested of Saul to kill King Agag and wipe out all the Amalekites. Saul refused. He didn't do it. So therefore, Saul lost his prestigious role as king of Israel, followed then by David. David. Haman is a descendant of the Amalekites. If Saul would have done his job, this may have never happened. It may have never occurred. Because this nuisance right here, this man who thought greater of himself than our God, he may have not have ever been in existence. Remember, he was a descendant of the Amalekite. If Saul would have done his job, wiped out the Amalekites, remember, the Israelites is God's chosen people. You don't mess with God's chosen people. God will pass judgment on those people. So therefore, if Saul would have done his job, Haman may, may not have ever been in this picture, but that may have been part of his plan. It may have been part of God's plan. The message that we're learning today from Esther. I just find that very interesting. Let me finish telling you this, the, a little bit about the last scene. Harbana. Where's Harbana? Harbana. Oh, Harbana is this little guy right here. Okay. He's a eunuch. He's a member of the royal palace. He's there to serve the king and what other, what other needs it might be to be met. Harbana was once an ally of Haman. It's tight. He realized what Haman was about to do, so he distanced himself from Haman. Corbana says this, sir, to the game, Haman just ordered the construction of a 75-foot gala to hang Mordecai, the man that saved you from an assassination. The king replied, remember, he's easily influenced. Let's hang Haman. <laughs> what, a, what an outcome. Gallo that was originally built for Mordecai, now built by Haman. Haman's pride for power and wealth led him to his own destruction. So I think that's another lesson to be learned about pride. Folks, I've got about four more minutes. I'm going to move on and go to scene two. You kind of know the situation now, what's occurring. Our actors are. Let's go to. Uh, Next one. This is Act Two. This is referred to as the Good Time, chapters eight through ten. Um, I've written an analogy from these two acts. This is my analogy, and I'd like to share it with you. I can find it. Imagine this, Kim. You're watching your favorite baseball team. Okay? Baseball team. <laughs> it's the bottom of the ninth inning. Your team is up to bat. That means it's the end of the game, Kim. <laughs> I don't watch the game. I don't bottom watch the ninth inning. Your, team, your team is up to bat. 
There's two outs, okay? However, the bases are loaded. Mm -hmm. I didn't know. <laughs> Your team is down three to nothing. Get the picture? So the grand slam. Get the picture? Things yeah, look pretty grim, don't they? Sounds like a grand slam. I was going to say, the grand slam. Tying run is on first base. Tying run is on first base. The winning run is the home plate, a plate ready to bat. Yes. Esther steps up. Now the count is three balls and two strikes. <laughs> and things don't look good mm -hmm. for the home team, does it? The question is, can Esther hit a home run? And drive the winning run home? Or does she strike out <laughs> and her team records a loss? Well, I've got just a couple more minutes to do a few more scenes. So let's let's see what happens. Here is scene one of act two. Esther saves the Jews. So therefore, if you want to turn to that section of your playbill and enter that, Esther saves the Jews. So it sounds like maybe the team may have come through. That's good, that. After Haman's death, the king awards the entire estate of Haman to Queen Esther. And he's worth millions and millions of dollars. He has a lot of precious, precious uh, possessions. The ring on the king's hand, he takes off, he presents it to Mordecai, appointing him the prime minister and taking Haman's place. Queen Esther now falls down before the king and says that she is Jewish and pleased with the king and not going to kill the Jews. She's making that plea. The second, um, the second scene in Act 2. Jews are united. You've been kind of going along, haven't you? I've been trying. Every time you put a yeah, new one, you. I've been hitting thank a new you. one. Per the king's commission, the king gave Mordecai permission to write a decree that will go into Persian law. That all Jews in the empire have now permission to unite and defend themselves. Why couldn't the king just go back and erase that decree that Haman wrote to destroy the Jews? Why couldn't he do that? Right. It's Persian law, isn't it? And the king didn't even have the power to go back and erase that decree. So that decree still stands. Jews will be annihilated on February the 28th. 28th. So all Jews have permission to unite and defend their lives against the destruction of their lives and the taking of their property. This decree became law throughout the entire Persian Empire. I have used 45 minutes, and I did not get to the mile marker that I wanted to do today. I'm sorry. I'm too long with it. I already told you you'd go three more Sundays. Well, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. But I am going to take about 30 minutes to 20 minutes next week to finish up the scenes in Act 2. And then I'd like to share with you a list of things. I think this is very important for you to take time to talk about. But it's the things that we can learn from Esther. I have nine points I'd like to share with you to take time to talk to you. But I think as we draw this study out to a close, it's very important that we know the events that take place. And I hope, I hope we've made it very clear in our discussion presentations that uh, you understand what's going on here. But I think the most important thing is not knowing, knowing not only the historical events happening chronologically, but what can we take away from what Esther did to save her, to save her nation. We'll do that. We'll do that next week. So with that being said, we uh, close in a word of prayer. Our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your unending blessings. Thank you for times when they grow discouraged, but you're always there to offer encouragement. Thank you for the times we may become misdirected, but you're always there to redirect our focus. And thank you for the times we may not always understand, but you're always there to offer us knowledge and wisdom. <clears throat> Dear God, our minds are now clear, our hearts have been softened. We are now receptive to receive your spoken word today. And dear Heavenly Father, as a final note, I ask for a special blessing to fall upon each person in this room. And as we go out, we might be able to apply some of the things that we've learned from the story of Esther. 
These things we pray in your son's name, Jesus Christ. All of God said. Amen. Amen. Thank you. I'll see you next Sunday. Wrap it up. Do you have another girl coming? Another girl? Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah.